sounds like that works. Is this on? Can anybody hear me? Terrific. You know, I got to tell you, when I uh, when I was at CSIS and uh, was a a uh, much less august predecessor to my good friend Scott Miller uh, as the show chair, the digs were not as nice. I got to say. <laughs> I see an awful lot of friends who've knocked around this town for a while who remember the old CSIS, where at this time of day, you always felt like you were going down into a cavern, down to like, I don't know, B-32 or something like that to, to go to one of these meetings. So the nice thing is there's actually natural light now. <laughs> really, you know, we're not all like mushrooms like we once were. So anyway, with that as sort of a starting point, I'm delighted to be here, and particularly for this program. Uh, my name is Grant Aldonis. Um, I'm a senior advisor at CSIS and uh, used to do a few things in the trade and investment arena. Today I usually describe myself as a blues artist and a grandfather because <laughs> of how I spend most of my time. But I have uh, the perspective of age, which is what I want to bring to this topic. Um, Twenty years ago, I'm surprised to say, I was a, young, a younger lawyer, I shouldn't say a young lawyer, uh, and I... Uh, chaired a, a task force of the American Bar Association on multilateral investment agreements. And in that, uh, we made the case, and I have to say this is, to get a position out of the ABA, you have to go through the trial lawyers, the section on environmental law, the section on labor law, the section on international, the whole sort of nine yards. So we worked our way to a consensus which was vigorously in support of not only multilateral investment agreements, bilateral investment agreements, but investor state. And the reason for that was that you could see then, just after uh, the Uruguay round, just after the creation of the WTO, that one of the large gaps remaining in the architecture of international economic law was, in fact, with respect to investment, and particularly with respect to investor state. And what struck me as I was thinking about this is that over the last 20 years, what's happened in the global economy has actually emphasized the need to close this gap. Because the reality of how we compete, everyone competes in the global economy, today is very different than it was 20 years ago. We've seen a revolution. You know, political changes, economic changes, technological changes, a broader plane surface in the economy, more than ever, the way American firms and American workers compete in the global economy is not limited to exporting. In fact, the real goal has to be to remain a part of the diffusion of technology, the diffusion of the knowledge that allows us to remain at the technological frontier and produce high paying jobs, all the, other, the growth that we want to see in the economy, and the stimulus that our growth provides to the rest of the world economy. To do that, the rules have to be things that guarantee a reward to both our firms and our workers in terms of their industry, their initiative, and their innovation. And the investment rules and dispute settlement are a part of that. That's one. Now, in the last 10 years, I've spent a lot more of my life where I started out when I was in the Foreign Service years ago, which is working on development issues. And what's been fascinating about the last 10 years is what it's reinforced for me is that, number one, the importance of institutions in the context of development, that in the absence of the right sort of institutions, very hard, very, very hard for a developing country, number one, to grow, but equally important to allow itself to be a part of a growing global economy, to be able to attract investment, to be able to, frankly, to guarantee a reward to their own innovators going forward. So to do that, they want to have an architecture that allows them to participate. And again, it struck me that closing the gap in terms of investment rules and a dispute settlement model that functions was very important. The critical thing we also know about development is that it depends on participating just as our firms have to in that flow, that diffusion of technology. And in the absence of those same rules that our firms, large and small, benefit from and need, there's no possibility of them closing the gap on the technological frontier. Our job is very hard to stay near it. Ironically, their job is much harder to close that gap. And the rules and dispute settlement are actually a critical part of it. So here's the irony, 20 years later, is that at the time that as the representative for the ABA and going and testifying in front of Congress, I was making a very basic point about investor state, I'm surprised that we're still having a debate about it. 
because the reality of investor state, from our perspective, is to guarantee no more than the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution already provides a foreign investor in our country. The irony is the obligation does not extend further than that which we already owe. And so the idea that we are stymied oftentimes in having a conversation about the clarity and importance of closing the gap is always surprising to me, particularly coming back to it after all these years, which is the main reason why when Scott asked, I was more than happy to say, love to come and have a conversation with you all. Certainly, we got a terrific set of panelists. Susan's great work, I think, is going to be helpful to everybody to inform that discussion. I know there's lots of people uh, in the audience who have their own reasons for wanting to know more about how this works, what are the arguments, how does this all reflect the panels that we have, and sort of the depth of experience is just remarkable. So my job is simply to uh, put my shoulder to the wheel along with everybody else and turn it over to my fe fellow blocking tackle here, <laughs> Scott Miller. Thank you. Good morning, and let me have a welcome to CSIS. Uh, I'm Scott Miller. I'm the, uh, a senior advisor in the Shoal Chair in International Business. Uh, and we thank you very much for, uh, for attending today. And thank you, Grant, uh, as uh, both my predecessor and my inspiration. So you, we're really, uh, it's always a delight to, uh, to have you here. I want to welcome all the people who are watching at CSAS.org. The, pro the program is being webcast live and will be available after the program uh, for viewing if you so choose. Uh, so, uh, in any case, our audience is, is both uh, very, very, very satisfying in the room, but, but uh, there's more outside as well, so thank you. International investment agreements have become a key source of controversy and concern by many uh, involved in trade and investment policy. Now, there's no shortage of programming on this subject. In fact, yesterday I was pleased to have attended an excellent presentation at an OECD conference which focused on foreign investments' contribution to growth and jobs, a very appropriate focus. But our focus is on investor state dispute settlement, specifically the provision in bilateral investment treaties and in international investment agreements that allows investors access to an arbitration mechanism with states over treaty breaches. ISDS, or Investor State Dispute Settlement, has been the subject of intense criticism and, to, to, in many circles, questions about its legitimacy as a policy tool. Today, we are uh, releasing a working paper that addresses this subject. The working paper will be available online. Uh, in fact, if, you, if you're here today and responded to the invitation, I think we're going to email it out to you. But at CSAS.org, on the events page, you'll find a, a PDF copy of our paper. We're trying to kill fewer trees, so we hope you'll, uh, you'll accept the PDF file. Uh, basically, uh, we have conducted an empirical review of investor state dispute settlement, starting with how it came to be such a relatively popular instrument, uh, uh, over 2,400 uh, bilateral treaties and investment agreements in force worldwide. We want to make some observations about uh, ISDS cases, both filed cases and completed cases, and some commentary on the expectations of both governments and investors. The report will be available, but let me launch our discussion today by giving you a, a brief summary of our findings. First, uh, while the ISDS as a, a whole is often portrayed as some out-of-control system, uh, what we've concluded is, in fact, it's quite stable and predictable in, in the, uh, both the, 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 where the cases come from and how they proceed. Uh, the first thing we'd observe is it's awfully quiet in a lot of places. Of the 2,400 bilateral investment treaties and investment agreements in force wor worldwide since 1959, over 90% of those treaties have never had an investor dispute. So basically, for the most part, it's working fairly well. Second, while there, it is clear that investment disputes have risen in quantity over the last decade, we found that the increase in investment uh, disputes is roughly uh, proportional to the increase in foreign capital stock invested. So yes, there are more cases, there are also more investors, and there is more investment, and those elements are, are in pretty direct proportion. When we looked at filed cases, uh, we found some things that, you, frankly, uh, we should have expected. First, that primarily the investors who, who participate in, in dispute settlement, who file cases, tend to come from large capital exporting economies and in relative proportion to the capital stock. For, for instance, the United States uh, is responsible for 24% of global 
foreign direct investment capital stock and has filed since the dawn of time 22% of the cases. Europe, uh, which has more than half of the uh, bilateral investment treaties in force, uh, uh, are, are, have a Europe, European party to them, Europe is responsible for 47% of global FDI stock and it filed just over half the cases. So again, not a surprise if you think about uh, uh, dispute settlement being in proportion to investment in the first place. Second, you, we were also not surprised to find that sectors which have a, a high level of state in intervention tend to be the most prominent sectors where cases occur. So uh, if I told you that 40% of investor state dispute settlement cases occurred in the oil, gas, mining, and electric power distribution sectors, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. And it turns out it wasn't a particular surprise to us. Third, we found that respondent states tended to be associated with states with weak in legal institutions. Uh, Argentina is the leading, res leading respondent state at 53 cases. Um, uh, Venezuela is number two at 36. So you get the idea both who files, what sectors they get filed in, and who the respondents are is probably what you'd predict from a starting point. Uh, when you look more in more detail at completed cases, the picture also becomes quite consistent. First, uh, what we learned from looking at all completed cases where we could find evidence, that about a third of cases, uh, the, the panel does not reach a decision. A third of cases are settled by the parties before the panel arrives at a decision. Second, for the cases that proceed to a panel decision, governments tend to win about twice as often as states. So from an investor's standpoint, it's actually much worse than a coin toss. Uh, in terms of who prevails uh, in the dispute settlement process. And when the investor does win, uh, awards tend to be a very small fraction of the claim, uh, on, on average, uh, less than 10 cents on the dollar. Finally, uh, we've, uh, our review would lead us to conclude uh, that many of the claims being made and the, the articles being written about investor state dispute settlement are somewhat overblown. Uh, I, I did a, a pretend word cloud. You know, how can you can use the, the, the web to create a word cloud? And the topic sentence would have been, ISDS cases give special rights to big companies to overturn regulations. <laughs> okay. Well, frankly, as Grant pointed out, the rights that are available to investors in, in, in the treaty obligations are not special. They're, in fact, quite ordinary. They are the basic rights accorded to all persons in the United States through the Fifth Amendment takings clause. They are the basic rights provided by the European Charter or the, and, and the United Nations Charter of Rights and Freedom. So th these are very basic rights about property and access to property and the right to uh, fair adjudication uh, and the right to reasonable, uh, uh, fair and equitable treatment before the law. Second, uh, the notion of overturning regulations is somewhat bizarre when you consider the actual text of treaties, which limit arbitral panels to making awards which are compensation or restitution of property. And we could frankly not find a case where a panel had actually get, given an award uh, that, that constituted a change in any regulation. In fact, most cases aren't about regulations themselves, but rather how they're applied. Panels can only award compensation. There have been an, a, a case or two that we found where as part of the settlement, uh, when the case was settled before the arbitral panel reached a decision uh, that a regulation found to be, say, uh, discriminatory was changed. But actually, no, no panel ever forced that, nor frankly could they, given the terms of the treaty. Finally, our biggest surprise was the notion that investor state dispute settlement is about big companies. We looked at all the American investors who have filed cases, and we were surprised to learn that over half of them would qualify for the Commerce Department's status of small or medium-sized enterprise, that is, fewer than 500 employees. So it, it, quite a different picture, and one that I hope we'll be able to talk more about today. Thanks uh, very much to uh, uh, Greg Hicks, who is a State Department visiting fellow at CSIS, who has had long experience in the Economic Bureau of the State Department on this, who, led, who was our lead researcher. You'll get a chance to ask questions for Greg and I uh, in a few moments, but we'd like to first turn to our keynote address by Professor Susan Frank. Uh, Susan Frank is a professor of law at Washington and Lee University, but more importantly, she is the, one of the leading investigators uh, into investor state dispute settlement, investor arbitration, and has done some of what I consider the most impressive empirical research uh, 
on, uh, on investment arbitration. So please welcome Professor Susan Frank. Wonderful. Well, thank you for having me here today. It's actually very much a treat to be here, to know that when you are an academic, your work is potentially useful to others, and it actually has some real-world experience, somewhat unusual for law professors. My own research was prompted by claims made by arbitration elites in 2005 about the state of international investment law, and I was not quite sure whether or not the claims were representative. So I essentially imparted on a journey to become the factcheck.org of investor state dispute settlement to see whether or not the claims I was hearing from the arbitrators from states, and to be blunt about it, even myself in my early scholarship were actually correct. I have to confess that I was originally trained as a psychologist, and part of this training made me did question, am I consuming and receiving information in a way that is balanced, that is appropriate, and that pushes beyond an emotive reaction, which I may have, to look at actual quantitative data and reality test my own assumptions. So I do fully appreciate that we can have emotive responses, but I would rather be right. And I, this was essentially what spawned my approach, which I call an evidence-based approach to international investment law. My, some of my deep mentors always encouraged me to think of assessments, assertions as hypotheses, hypotheses to be tested. And I hope that when we think about narratives related to international investment law, that we can use that approach to help us understand the system, because the narratives could very well be correct. And it was, it's always a delight when your childhood heroes, mine were Kahneman and Tversky, because that's the kind of nerd that I am, actually become front and center in books like Thinking Fast and Slow. It is entirely correct that the narratives that we see, the things that we read could in fact be correct. But again, we need to test this against the logic and the actual data to provide a framework. I'm also the daughter of a farmer and an engineer, which means I want to create strategies that don't create more problems. I would rather create tailored normative reforms that generate tailored normative valuable solutions. So what does this mean for you and for me in terms of the work that I have undertaken to understand this area of private international law? It means that I need evidence. Before I make claims, before I make assertions, I need data. My data comes from a very uh, large now set of data sets related to public awards. That will inevitably mean that there are some case selection effects, and I'm absolutely happy to talk about those and let my inner quant nerd come to the fore. Uh, I just need to flag this now because one of the things that Scott said is a third of the cases, for example, get settled. So if, for example, they're settled prior to the making of a public award, they will be excluded. So these, these are the sorts of caveats that I must make to make sure that you appreciate it's a garbage in, garbage out standard, and I have to always recognize the limit limitations of the data that I do use. But we've been very, very, very rigorous about this because I do fully appreciate the high stakes involved and I'm happy to talk to you about it. But the data set is massive. It's more than, uh, gosh, I think 150,000 pieces of individualized information that has come from the cases. But we now have a total of over 272 public awards as at the end of 2012 with 159 different final awards. And these become the basis of the information that I'm going to provide you with today. How do you start with factcheck.org? You start with an assessment or an assertion or a belief or a hypothesis. There are different hypotheses in this area. One hypothesis is that investors largely win, and there is a pro-investor bias in the result. The counter-narrative is that that is not correct, and in fact, sometimes they win, sometimes they lose, and then sometimes you even hear things on the other side. Well, what do the data say? Because these are very serious claims. I also teach civil procedure, 
and the idea that any system that is rule of law based and creates unfair outcomes does trouble me greatly. So what do the data say? The data say that investors win, but also that states win. The state win rate represents the red bar. The data now actually show that it is not just that states win, it is that states win reliably more than investors. The ratio in my own study, which apparently is somewhat similar to Scott's, it's about a two to three ratio. So for every two states investors win, states win three. And now that we have 144 final awards that we can analyze in connection with this, like just the green bar and just the red bar, that difference is actually statistically meaningful. I get to say that for the first time. It does make me a little bit nervous, but I've spent a lot of time talking with uh, psychologists and other quantitative scholars to make sure I'm correct on that point. I guess in a way this slightly surprised me because my earlier research that ended in 2006 showed almost exactly the same thing. Uh, the same pattern, but in those days the data set was smaller and I could not say it was reliably different. It would have been quite wrong of me to do so. But the pattern is the same. And so I said to my husband, I said, it's the same, I've done something wrong. And he reminded me as a scientist that all I can do is A, repeat what the data say, and B, suggest that it is a, if it is this stable over time with nearly a 300% increase in the caseload, perhaps indeed this is actually the way the system works and that states do tend to win more often than others. And because of the concerns about what it means to have a pro-investor bias in the system, I've talked with other people about this. I was fortunate enough to have a conversation with Ted Eisenberg before he passed away last year. He's one of the leaders in empirical legal scholarship in the world. I say is, but he's, he's passed now, that's hard for me. But um, he, one of the things he said to me was, Susan, if you look at empirical research in other contexts against states by people, Usually states win more anyway. So this, in a way, makes me wonder, with the new data, whether or not investor state dispute settlement is just rather a very typical phenomena in dispute settlement more generally. It just happens to be that here we're talking about investors and states and the stakes are high, but if it's happening in, for example, Bivens claims or whistleblower claims, the people making the whistleblowing claims rarely win. Key TAM litigation involving state sovereignty, that's another situation where states are winning or and the people bringing the claims aren't winning as much. This may be just a normal phenomenon when you have a state as a respondent. So I would suggest that that's a way of potentially thinking about these particular results. But winning and losing, this being the difference between I got a zero award and I got a cent or more, is a very rough binary way to be thinking about outcomes. Outcomes are also a function of how much. So there have, for example, been, whoops, I've already gone a little too far. Um, and you've now watched, this is a very interesting approach. You've, <laughs> you have now see, you've previewed it, so now I feel like the cat is out of the bag, but let's get to it. Part of what I, I was looking at was actually, do we have large claims and large awards? And again, this is, I think, a very important claim to evaluate. But what I thought was most interesting was the framework, the, if you will, the visual image that you get from looking at the difference between an ask and a get is fairly substantial, and it was about as substantial as it was in my earlier research. The difference between the mean amount claimed and the mean amount awarded is 606 million, at least as at the end of 2012. So this meant on average for all cases, right, including the wins and the loss, for all cases, that means investors were getting 18 cents on the dollar, or two cents on the median. But again, that includes those cases where respondent states won, and again, that was a pretty large chunk of the data set. So it's important to exclude those because otherwise the zeros will pull the mean 
towards the bottom so it's important to also take a look at what's going on in terms of the raw amounts awarded for the small subset of cases the about the one third of cases where investors did win you see a very similar pattern, namely there's a difference between an ask and a get. And here the means and medians for an average and median amount awarded are actually much similar. They're around 31 to 32 cents on the dollar, so about a third of what you get overall, but there's still a disjunction. One of the things this says to me is that the arbitral tribunals are actually waiting, weeding out some of the unmeritorious claims. In other words, they're doing the job that they're supposed to be doing, making sure the people with claims that don't work are actually excluded. But I want to give you another sense of it. And for those uh, Eat lawn, econ, or poli sci nerds, you may appreciate something that's called a box plot that I'm about to put up. But if you haven't seen one of these before, I'm going to walk you through it. Look for a big black line. It is the median bar. The first chart is going to be the amounts claimed, and it will give you a dollar for dollar sense of the difference between amounts awarded. So you'll see on the amounts claimed graph, there's a very large cluster all under 300 million. The big black line is the median. The professor gets to do a little action now. Here's the majority of your claims. Two quartiles worth of data in terms of your request. This is 300 million. This is 100 million. Walk yourself over from the median claim. Go to the median award and you'll find this is maybe 70%, 70, 75% or higher of all claims. The median, here's zero, here's the median amount awarded. This is the subset for only those cases where investors win. But these are broad data. Part of it is also a function of, well, we always like to think that there's an explanatory explanation for this broad data. My psychology professor, who also taught me in quantitative methods, liked to say we lust for cause. We want to understand why these things happen in the manner in which they do. So I decided to look, oh gosh, it's done it again. Um, I decided to not just look at these raw descriptive data that I provided earlier, but also look at how those outcomes varied according to other variables. But outcome is really tricky because it seems to me, and again, this is probably the psychologist talking, it seems to me that it doesn't matter if you're a plaintiff or, pardon me, an investor or a respondent, nobody does seem to be happy. So you can be an investor who wins cash and still decide that you're unhappy with the outcome. You can be a state who is found to have no breach and, in fact, no violation of international law, no amount awarded against you, and you can also be very unhappy. So in order to provide some clarity about what outcomes mean, there are at least three variables that I looked at. One is the raw win or lose. Did I get one cent or more awarded or did I get nothing? One is the amount awarded, the sheer dollar value, and of course, always adjusted for inflation. And then, of course, the investor success rate, namely the respective difference between what you ask for and what you get. And I looked at a couple of different variables. There are many more that I could talk about, but there are a couple that are near and dear to my heart that I personally have worried a great deal about, and I'm going to walk you through some of those today. One of them relates to the development background of the states. This really does matter because if investor state dispute settlement is unfairly tilted in a way that is in disadvantaging developing countries when they're trying to evolve, that does concern me. So one of the things that I did was I looked at outcomes, all of those outcomes, as a function of a respondent state's development background using a variety of different metrics. I figured 
I have one idea, but other people might have others of what it means to be developed. So I looked at the OECD classification of the respondent state. I looked at how the World Bank classified the respondent date at the time of the award. I looked at how the United Nations Development Program's conception of human development index might actually affect these things. And I looked at outcomes for respondent states controlling for the effect of democracy to see if there was some kind of link between outcomes and respondent states. The answer was I couldn't find any kind of a difference. Every single time, it doesn't mean it's not there, that's science, I have to acknowledge that, but every single time I looked, I ran it nine different ways and I've showed you the printouts on the slides. The top numbers are the R values for the statistics geeks out there, and the, the second layers are the P values, and the third layer is the N. The R values are all under 0 0.10. For those of you who understand that, that means that is almost less than statistically small. That is like finding a needle in a haystack. If you want to make sure that there is a needle in the haystack, you'll need an over 700 completed arbitration awards. This is potentially, if it's there, it is a very small effect, and none of it was statistically significant. So I, even though there are lots of cases against countries that we may have deep emotive sympathy for, it does suggest to me that once you control for democracy levels, there doesn't seem to be an unfair balance in terms of the outcome, or at least this is part of the evidence that would cast doubt on those concerns. Those are legitimate concerns. But if I can't find it, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm looking at the R values and the P values, which should be indicators of its importance or it's not, and I'm finding something very small, that's something that I pay attention to. I've been doing this kind of research since 2006, and when I can't find anything, it's very, it's very odd, but you could keep looking. That's the background on respondent states. But it also matters as part of the debate who the investors are. And this is actually very hard work to do because figuring out who the investors are is not that easy. So one of the things that I did was I created one measure of looking at investors and the first measure was are you a human being? Is someone in your case a publicly listed entity? Does Bloomberg somehow indicate that you are a privately held corporation? And then I started to look at outcomes as a function of who the investors were and tried to see if there was a difference. That was one way. So let's then look a little bit about the breakdown. If you are a human being, your ratio of wins to losses is about 50-50. Human beings are doing pretty good. If you are a publicly held entity or have at least one publicly held entity bringing the case, you're kind of in a 50-50, right? The historical rule, despite the fact that we can now say that there's a bit of a pro-state bias, the historical rule is under the Priest-Klein model, that all things being equal, the reason you bring to case to a court or a tribunal is because it could go either way, because it's a tough case. So you see that with the public corporation. You see that with the individuals, the human beings bringing cases. But you see where you don't see that? The wholly private corporations. In other words, I think that this is maybe more of a match for your small and medium, oh, I did it again, enterprise model. And that to me, that is very interesting because there the states are winning twice as often as the investors are. publicly held, publicly listed, and traded on the stock exchange. Not state-owned. We were very careful about this. Like I said, it's very hard to, to do this work, and at one point the OECD actually tried and then stopped because it is so difficult. But I have a very good library at Washington and Lee, and Bloomberg has a great data set, and we are very, very, very persistent. So we try hard, hard to do that. But again, this is one way of thinking about who the investors are. There's another way of thinking about it, 
which is you're a Financial Times entity or not. And this is why I say thinking about investor identity is complex, because for the first time in the, I, that I was able to see, I actually did find a statistically meaningful difference, namely that the Financial Times 500 entities did win more often than the government, at least as compared to the entities that didn't have a Financial Times 500 entity listed in the case. This is the only evidence that I have been able to see that identifies pro-investor bias. But I wanted to flag two things that I think are important. The first is that the Financial Times 500 entities are roughly 10% of the overall caseload. So this is not a huge proportion of the cases that are actually being brought. So you have to decide if you're a state policymaker whether or not you want the tail to wag the dog. That's number one. Number two, one of the things that Ted Eisenberg also talked to me when I was speaking with him about my research is that he said there's probably a case selection effect here. Namely, the people are bringing the cases and they're being very careful about it. And so perhaps all they are doing is they're making a better bet in terms of knowing that they should bring the claim forward at all. If you will, they have a more sophisticated screening methodology and they're more careful about deciding when, where, and how to bring the claims. And I thought, you know, that will sh shake out over time, but I thought it was an interesting perspective. And the reason why I think it is particularly interesting, and I'm gonna skip ahead slightly just a bit, is because I want to show you something else about these Financial Times entities in terms of what happens in terms of relative success of the investors. I can get it to go. Because once you look at the relative success of investors in the small subset of cases where investors actually did win, the relative success rate is roughly equivalent and it is in terms of the descriptive data and it's not statistically meaningful. So for example, the relative success of a Financial Times 500 entity is roughly 38%, 37.7, and for the non-financial times investors who are bringing cases, it's about 34. So 3% on the margins when you've got those kind of standard deviations, it's not necessarily appropriate to say that there's a statistically meaningful difference. And look at the R value. It's again under 0.10. But it is complex, because the other thing that I do need to show you is who the investors are, the people. And it is going kind of wild again. Sorry. If I can get it to go forward. This is very, very interesting indeed. OK, and it's gone too far. Can I just go back one? Just one, just one. So I love technology, but sometimes it really gets you. Ah, bless. Okay, this is the group of all, all cases again, and it gets even more extreme when you look at the subset of investor satisfaction, or investors who have actually won and are satisfied. Look at the difference between who's having the highest level of success rate. Cases brought by human beings have the highest level of success rate. And when you actually then focus on the subset, the investor success level goes up to a roughly, I, th I think that it is, let me just make sure I've got the right number, it goes up to roughly 45%. Right? And in fact, that then becomes a meaningful distinction. In other words, human beings bringing cases do better than private corporations. That actually was very interesting to me because it means the biggest predictive variable is whether or not your investor is a bunch of humans or a single human being. But it shows that 30% of individuals, uh, or rather individuals get roughly about 30% of what they ask for in all the cases, as opposed to public corporations, at least one public corporation, a little bit lower. And then private corporations getting 10% of what they ask for. And again, this is partially a function of the fact that so many of those private entities were not recovering at all. So it's a very, important story about what's going on with outcomes. Yes, states are winning more. Generally, they're winning more. And generally, investors, when they do win, are not winning that much, roughly about a third. It says to me that maybe we should care less about who the respondents are and more about creating narrowly tailored normative solutions to address concerns that we have about who are bringing the claims. 
Maybe the publicly held and Financial Times entities are a little bit more responsible and the individuals as well. Think about access to justice for small human beings. Uh, but there are opportunities for normative reform. That's outcome. How long does it take and how much does it cost? Those were two of the best questions I would get when I practiced in DC and in London. In terms of how long, it can be quite a long time. Three and a half years is about the average time. Short times under a year, 10 months, long times can go on quite, quite, quite a long time. And it may be because the parties are trying to engage in settlements or other kinds of alternative dispute re resolution. Right, so there is quite a long time that does go on with these disputes. And how much does it cost? Get ready to pick your jaws up off the floor. It usually costs for both parties a little bit under 10 million. Uh-huh. I started this research because I was very interested in the costs in part because in one of my very first articles I said we didn't have to worry about unmeritorious claims because cost shifting would occur. And then I actually wondered, am I right about that? And it turns out that actually I was wrong. And this is why I, I prefer data, because data will tell you when you are wrong. But you do see that the party's legal costs are actually quite large. And there is a suggestion in the data that actually the costs have been increasing over time, which wouldn't surprise one if the legal teams were getting larger over time as well. In terms of tribunals, tribunals are actually roughly fairly inexpensive expensive, and their cost has not changed very much over time. It used to be that they were around 600,000, that wasn't adjusted for inflation, but now it's about 800,000-ish. And those tend to get split in roughly equal ways. And one of the things that is not in this presentation in terms of a slide, but I can and should flag to you, because this is another one of those times when I was wrong, some people have historically said that there's a one-way cost-shifting rule that operates only in favor of investors. And I thought that that was wrong because I couldn't find any data to support that. But in the new generation of data, you actually do find that. So two things then happen. More often than not, there is no cost-shifting in international arbitration. So each party bears its own costs. But you can't predict that. And now I will tell you why. Because there is a one-way cost-shifting rule that operates in favor of investors overall. So what that means is the reason we don't see cost-shifting is because the states are winning and then there's no cost-shifting. But when the investors win in that small subset, guess what happens? There is cost-shifting that is occurring in favor of the investors, which then if you're a state and you're thinking about how do we change the rules of the game, although Judge Schwabel may disagree with me as a matter of international law, one may suggest that states could create a cost-shifting rule that operated in their favor if they wished to create the right set of incentives. Just a thought. Slightly controversial, I recognize. But what does this mean at overall in terms of the dispute resolution calculus for investor state dispute settlement? It means that the cost, that the damages that are being claimed are rather large, but it also means that the amounts awarded are much smaller. And in then with pre-award interest, at least on the basis of the data I have, which I must admit is incredibly vague because tribunals don't put this information in their awards with the degree that they should, in my view, uh, that means that it does suggest that the awards of interest are seven million. Think about that average award, 16, average invest, uh, interest rate, seven million. And it means then that the cost of the lawyers and the tribunal is about 10 million. And one wonders, what the value proposition is for investors. So it would suggest to me that if investors actually want this, they may wish, you know, get what they wish for, but they may do so at their peril, but it would then suggest that it is actually an important tool for them to use if it is available. So my overall synthesis before I wrap up, and apparently the screen has done it for me, is that generally I think the investment treaty arbitration is maturing like other innovations in domestic legal settings, in international law, things evolve over time, it does not, it's un, that's unsurprising. And there are elements about the system that are useful, weeding out unmeritorious claims, being careful about how, how you do things, but some elements are of more concern, 
related to, for example, costs, interest, cost shiftings, they're areas for consideration. But what I'd like to suggest today to the policy community is that if there are concerns that we have, and there are some concerns to address, then we can create targeted reforms rather than blunt reforms. To use a medical analogy, if you have a headache, you don't get a triple bypass. You maybe think first whether or not you should take some aspirin and then perhaps get some diet and exercise. And over time, with targeted reforms, you may feel better without needing something more invasive. Thank you, Susan. Uh, uh, if you're like me, uh, I, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm reminded of a Far Side cartoon, uh, which is of a classroom, and there was a young man holding up his hand and saying, Professor, may I be excused? My brain is full. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, thank you. That was awesome uh, rendition of a lot of decades of research now. So pretty close to it. So thank you. Uh, we'd like to open for questions, uh, if there are any. Uh, what, uh, just so you know, there are three rules for questions here at CSIS. First, wait for the microphone uh, because of our uh, on online audience. Second, introduce yourself and your state your organization. And third, make sure your question's in the form of a question. So with that, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Marty Weiss with the U.S. Congressional Research Service. Um, so one thing we didn't talk about that much this morning is variability within, I mean, among the treaties. Um, you talked about doing targeted, targeted reforms for investor state dispute settlement. Given the fact that, you know, with thousands of treaties, different rules and ad hoc created um, panels for each dispute settlement, how do you see dealing with uh, inconsistencies within rewards? Uh, a lot of the... Um, Kind of the concern you've, we've heard about ICSID reform over the past couple of years about uh, how can we make these uh, awards uh, more legitimate. And then if you can talk about a little bit moving beyond that, <coughs> as we move in towards mega regional type agreements where we're combining trade and investment remedies in the same agreement, how do you see reconciling kind of public law issues with trade with the private dispute settlement uh, in the investment treaty side and how when you can have various disputes such as the Australia cigarette case which could legitimately be brought under either um, you know under under trade or investment uh, dispute settlement so how do you see that system kind of building out um, forward well I am but a humble law professor in Lexington Virginia so I'll do what I can to answer for my own uh, own research but I, I will flag that uh, one of my first articles was about what I call the legitimacy crisis in international investment law, um, in part because back in 2004, I had been involved in, at a, at a time when there was, well, probably 20 or fewer cases, I had been involved in three that had had inconsistent, if you will, legal reasoning, right? So I'd been involved in the Lauder and the CME cases, um, working at, with the tribunal in one of them. I'd been involved in the SGS cases in connection with my work in Australia, work in, in London. And I thought, how much inconsistency can one farm girl from Iowa take? And I then wrote an article identifying my own concerns. So the concerns that you're talking about, inconsistencies within the case law, these are things that are real and they're important. So my response is actually the response that I gave in that article back in 2000, and it was published in 2005, so nearly 10 years ago, which is to the extent that you're trying to deal with doctrinal inconsistencies across treaties, there is a real value to be considered in creating some kind of a public appellate mechanism to redress those concerns. Because different treaties have different textual obligations, and I respect that because that is an exercise of sovereignty. Different states may have different needs and different priorities, and those sovereign choices in how disputes are crafted in treaties or not, and grants of rights, whether they be trade or investment related, are very important decisions by states. There's no doubt 
about that. But to the extent that you can have one holistic appellate body that could, for example, identify what is similar and identify what is different and begin to create a set of, a set of consistent jurisprudence, that would personally help me tremendously. And to be honest, one of the concerns that I've always had in my own research is how do you know what's the legally correct outcome? So I can control, for example, of, for something related to legal correctness. I am not able to do that without an appellate body providing me clear guidance about what the legally correct outcome always is or should be. With that, I could then control for that, and then you could see much better variation within the statistical analyses. So in, in that sense, I think there are solutions that are structural solutions that could potentially provide safeguards to the arbitration process so that it could actually function effectively and retain the value that it are always has. Hi, Nate Graham with Procter & Gamble. Thank you for the presentation. I think that's um, a you know, really helpful way for all of us to, to think about these issues. Um, question on the third of the cases that go to settlement after the process is initiated. Does your research give you any insight into um, uh, w the value of those settlements or whether the state or the investor is more likely to concede in, in those settled cases. Mm -hmm. This is a good point as well. There's two things I want to flag with that. The data that suggests about a third of the cases settle comes from potentially three places. Apparently, the research that CSIS has done to the data from ICSID, and of course ICSID data actually includes investor state disputes under treaties and investor state disputes under national law. So you got to be careful because ICSID data actually conflates two different things. We're talking today about international law, but some of their data is about domestic law disputes. Okay, so that's, but they've got a pot of it. And also, I believe that Michael Weibel has some research that shows the same thing, namely that about a third of the disputes settle. But I think he also uses the ICSID data to do that. But what that says to me, and research by Michael Reisman has also looked at this. He's got an article in the ICSID review called Arbitration and ADR Married but Best Living Separately. Um, I will take issue with, him, with, it, with that. We have talked about that in the past. But the third of those cases, it does seem to be consistent across people's research. So that's very interesting in and of itself. My research only shows about 10% of cases settling, but that's because I'm coding them after there is another document. For example, a jurisdictional award, and then someone settles or discontinues, which says to me that settlement can occur theoretically at any time in the dispute resolution process, not necessarily just at the front end. And at my core, I'm probably more of an alternative dispute resin scholar resolution scholar than an arbitration uh, junkie. Right? I, I, this is the area of my research, but I want to encourage states or investors or whoever, when they're thinking about dispute settlement, to think more broadly about the methodologies that could solve those problems. For example, mediation. If there were very clear mediation rules within the text of investment treaties, you could potentially prevent disputes from going to arbitration, right? And then we could know more about why those cases settle. What I can tell you about when the cases settle is going to be highly anecdotal, and I'm not going to be able to give you a comprehensive approach. But I can tell you that there have been cases that I've seen where they have settled after a jurisdictional ruling. There have been cases where, for example, they decide to renegotiate the commercial terms. There have actually been, there was one very interesting settlement, I'll never forget this one, although it did spawn later arbitration, Lemire versus Ukraine, the very first case in Lemire created a settlement agreement where there was actually no money that traded hands at all. The settlement agreement was relating to opening up trading possibilities, not for the radio station at issue, but the Oksana Bayul beauty salon that the investor actually really wanted to market. And I thought that that was brilliant because it showed me that states can actually be very creative about finding value and, if you will, retaining sovereignty in the settlement of the dispute. If you're, if you're a skeptic of ISDS, there's nothing, nothing in, in your research that people could point to to say um, people, investors bring the dispute 
and the state, after looking at it, or there's a jurisdictional award, decides, wow, we better settle this or else it could be worse for us. There, in other words, could, could skeptics of ISDS point to settlements um, as a way to say that investors are pushing this too far, that states are more likely to cave in, in, a, in a settlement scenario? I'm not, I'm not sure about that because not all states do settle it. I think sometimes it's actually very difficult. I mean, part of the reason I want to flag this is I, I worked for a semester. I had the great privilege of working with the United Nations Trade um, at UNCTAD in Geneva, the Trade and Development C Conference. And I had a chance to meet a lot of stakeholders, namely states from different parts of the world, usually the developing world. And I, I would hear their stories. And again, this is a, just a, it's an anecdote, and it may not be representative. But I saw people who really wanted to work hard to create alternative dispute resolution, not because they wanted to cave, but because they were trying to build capacity within their home jurisdictions, because they knew that there would be a follow-on effect related to the development grant of development of international institutions that would facilitate greater trade and commerce abroad. So to the extent that settlement is a bad thing, I mean, you can argue that, but I would think that developing the capacity to manage conflict within developing countries actually has huge potential value, both for the state itself and also for the investors who may come to the state later on. Yeah, I would just add that the best data source is probably ICSID, and it's really, the evidence is very thin about why cases settle. So it's, it's, it was very difficult. We, we could tell which cases settled, but in terms of drawing a conclusion about why they settled or under what terms they settled, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really kind of, it's kind of murky. Uh, the, the one thing I would add, just as a piece of perspective, is that it, when, you, when you look at this as a whole, uh, dispute settlement, uh, on investment treaties looks a lot like complex civil litigation uh, that, that firms may enter into. Uh, and uh, in complex civil litigation, it's, they're about it, they're expensive, they're time consuming, but they also tend to settle at a fairly reasonable rate and usually settlements aren't disclosed. So it's just, it's, it's one of the things that is, I, I think, consistent with what Susan has said about you know, how this fits into the broad uh, scope of uh, international law. That's the best we can do. And, and I also do want to flag that I think some developing states in particular find it very difficult to settle because they don't necessarily have the settlement authority or indeed the national reserves that are allocated to these sorts of things. So it can be actually be very, very challenging. Again, this is why capacity building related to investor state dispute settlement and mediation and conflict management and conflict prevention can be so important because you can create internal protocols for thinking about how do we want to manage our government policy. That's got to be useful to any state. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for that excellent uh, presentation um, and the clarity with which you express yourself. Could you uh, introduce yourself and your I'm organization? Uh, I'm Bob Bastine with the uh, Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. And, um, but my question is uh, whether you have had a chance to um, examine the text of the Canadian-European Trade Agreement, which uh, I see you smiling, uh, <laughs> which has contained some modifications in the investment chapter, which uh, we understand are designed to respond to the, uh, the, cl the clamor, the concern of stakeholder, European stakeholders, and uh, which modify to, s to the distress of some American uh, experts, uh, modify or attempt to define terms like, I think, fair and equitable, equitable is one, um, that uh, uh, create new problems. Um, so I'm just, I'm just asking whether you've had a chance to, to take a look at that and what your thoughts might be. I've looked at parts of it. My response would be that actually the, th the thing that troubled me personally, but I would say this given my last comment, was that at one point there had actually been a protocol in the draft treaty for the settlement of disputes related to investor state mediation. And it, my understanding is that that is no longer part of the agreement. So the idea that it was introduced but then it hasn't gone anywhere, it, it's a lost opportunity in my view. That actually is something that I would be much more interested in. As a policy guy, not a researcher, I would uh, say that there tends to be a reaction when, uh, in the United States, uh, we negotiated some very sp strong bilateral investment treaties and included very strong provisions in the NAFTA as the first comprehensive agreement, and were very surprised that we had cases filed against us. <laughs> okay, and, and part of that surprise, now, now that didn't just happen in NAFTA, by the way. 
That happened in WTO dispute settlement as well, where members of Congress advocated for years for a binding dispute settlement because the old non-binding GATT frustrated them to no end. Those same members were often quite surprised uh, to find us on the receiving end of, say, the Venezuelan reformulated gas case where Venezuela, plucky Venezuela, walks into the WTO, files a case against the United States, and wins. <laughs> okay. It's like, how could this happen? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So that kind of shock happens. And, and, and I, I would argue, as somebody who participated in the 2004 model bit review process, that there was substantial defensive concern on the part of the U.S. government. Uh, that, was, that was reflected in some of the changes in the treaty uh, between uh, the 2004 model bit and its predecessor. I think to, you know, Canada, as, as Greg and I uh, found, is one of the leading, is the leading respondent of OEC, in, among OECD members. Canada has more cases filed against it than any other member of the OECD. And uh, so I, and I'm speculating here, but my guess is one of the things that's, that may be going on there is, uh, is some defensive interests becoming more prominent in the debates uh, within government. So I think that's going to happen. I think it's going to settle out now. I will credit in, in the United States, while we did change, make some changes in the model bit, which did uh, respond to domestic concern, uh, uh, defensive concerns, I should say. Also, there were some changes made that were very important from a public interest standpoint uh, in terms of transparency and uh, be, being able to eliminate frivolous cases and things like that. So there, there, were, there were some substantive uh, uh, changes, but they, those all changes were responsive to kind of what happened and the political surprises associated with, with the NAFTA. So I, I think that's common in, in our public policy debates and probably a healthy uh, means. Let me switch sides here. I'll get two on this side. Yes, Grant. Thank you. Sorry, a comment, not a question, in response to the earlier question about uh, the settlement issue and whether or not. Uh, Governments are cowed into settling. And I have to say my experience, first as an international lawyer litigating uh, under these rules, and then as a government official, and more recently as an arbitrator, the risk perception is just the opposite. From a government official's perspective, the risk is always leads you to go ahead with the litigation, if there's any question. Because that's the safe political position, frankly. And the benchmark, and I'm glad you mentioned it, Scott, is WTO litigation. You see this constant. Uh, appellate process working because no government can be satisfied with the panel determination so they necessarily appeal anything that is even remotely controversial at a political level to the appellate body. Indeed, oftentimes compelling the appellate body to rule in areas where there is no law based on what the negotiators originally did. This model is very different in the sense that there is law. It's the law of the case, the law of the agreement, and it's the law that is designed under the treaty. So ironically, it's a safer system than WTO, but the same risk is there. The government generally will litigate if there's any perception of risk. Right. right. I want to just flag two things. There's some wonderful political scientists who have wrote about this, and they call it domestic political cover. Todd Alley, he was, at, I believe he's just, uh, at, yeah, Todd Alley, he's at Maryland, or he's just moved to George Washington, but he's written about that, and that's very interesting. Um, the second thing I wanted to flag is that if you are a fan of Kahneman and Tversky and their prospect theory at all, you will understand that a state will view this as a loss, and so as a matter of prospect theory, it always makes sense to take the gamble if you're in one of these situations situations where it's essentially high risk, right? Whether it's a financial risk or a political risk, uh, it's a high risk situation. You're more willing to roll the dice. I mean, that's the, that's the way it works. Thank you. I'm Dan O'Flaherty with the National Foreign Trade Council. Given the findings that you've presented today, uh, politically, how do you explain the uh, pushback against uh, investor state? Uh, in Europe uh, and uh, in a place like South Africa, which uh, Grant said that uh, developing countries uh, like to have institutionalized uh, mechanisms, uh, and they are allowing, uh, I think, six of their uh, bilateral investment treaties to lapse on this issue. I would have to speak to that probably as a psychologist first. So again, my bias is that it's going to be a psychological viewpoint. So please take that with a, with a grain of salt. But to me, it's, it's largely because of cognition. 
and cognitive illusions. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a little thing called primacy. The primacy effect is that you remember the first thing that you get. So if you see a $600 million claim on your desk, that's what you see, that's what you remember. There's also a little thing called negativity biases. The negativity biases is that you remember negative things that you hear about. They're easier to recall. They then become available. Those get affected by the availability heuristic and then suddenly you've got an availability cascade and you start to think that they're very prevalent when in fact they're not. There's also something then called a recency bias. Namely, you hear something more recently, like the UCOS case. Oh, that's a very large award. Oh my goodness, what's going on? And then you start to think that these cases are normal and relevant are, and quite, quite prevalent. So you start to get, if you will, kind of the perfect storm of all of these cognitive illusions hitting you and forming policy even when they don't necessarily reflect the statistical base rates. Statistical base rates are very hard to absorb. I mean, they, they are. I mean, it's much easier to remember one poignant story. How do charities get people to give? They tell the story of one orphan hurt by a tsunami rather than talking about the overall statistical information because you respond emotively to the story. Uh, I would actually target it to uh, the advocacy that is done for trade agreements. Uh, having been an advocate for trade agreements in a previous life, uh, I think trade people are very good about talking about trade agreements and not very good about talking about investment. Okay, uh, the, the, the Washington community is pretty skilled at, at uh, talking issues of market access and issues of, uh, of trade remedies and issues of, of, uh, of dispute settlement in, uh, in, in trade agreements. What we've done, though, is we've stuck investment treaties inside of trade agreements, which share some language on occasion but mean different things. I mean, Fair and equitable means different things. Uh, discrimination means different things in investment agreements than it means in the rest of, the, uh, of that trade agreement, okay? And, and my sense is, and this was some, some practice after, you know, the, the, there was a big hubbub uh, around the time of Trade Promotion Authority uh, 12 years ago, uh, dealing with the NAFTA cases. And I found my friends in the lobbying community could make a good case for NAFTA trade rules, uh, but, uh, but basically uh, started to tie their loafers as soon as somebody mentioned uh, one of the NAFTA Chapter 11 cases, and they kept tying them until the screaming stopped. <laughs> okay, so I think we as a, a the, the pro-trade, pro-investment community, I think need to do a better job of, of sort of characterizing what's really going on here. And we need to better understand that these are different things, okay? A, a trade dispute gets resolved in a, in a prospective manner. Uh, somebody corrects a tariff. Somebody corrects a rule, okay, and it, happened, it, it covers a broad class of trade, a whole tariff line. An investment dispute is about an enterprise, okay? It has no prospective remedy. It, the only remedy is, is uh, compensation or restitution of property. It's an entirely different enterprise, and we've jammed them together in a political document, and we've, these comprehensive, broad-based treaties, have a, or, uh, trade agreements, have a lot of things to talk about. So I think, I, I think, you know, I would encourage my, my fellow lobbyists, to, uh, uh, former colleagues, uh, to, to actually try to get better at understanding what the differences are and uh, move it ahead, but it's a tough one. I have time for one more question, yes. Uh, Kim. Uh, Kim Elliott with the Center for Global Development, and I want to get Greg to weigh in here on this issue of the, the the settled cases, we don't know the content of the settlement, but do the respondents and claimants, presumably we have some information about who they are, do they look at all different from the other cases? Uh, actually, they don't. I mean, they pretty much conform to the full range of participants. And in some cases, we do know the contents of settlements, and in some cases, we don't. Uh, the, some of the major settlements out there are uh, Ethel versus Canada, S.D. Myers, uh, or the first Battenfall uh, dispute. And so, but in general, again, there's an incentive among both investors and states towards confidentiality. Mm -hmm. you know, neither really wants all of this information out in the public. States understand there's reputational risk associated with this, just as companies understand that there's reputational risk. And that's one of the reasons why, historically, the, the 
inventors of this system gravitated towards binding arbitration because it had had so much success in settling commercial disputes. Hope that helps. Thank you, Ed. As the moderator, I always have to apologize for cutting off a discussion just when it's getting good. Yeah, I'm, I'm the guy who takes away the punch bowl when the party starts to pick up. So in any case, but uh, let, let's now move to our second panel. But first, uh, uh, again, let's recognize Dr. Franken for her contribution. <laughs> Let me invite the panelists. Very quick scene change here, and we'll get right back to it. Uh. To build out the practical side of, uh, of the, the experience with investor state dispute settlement, uh, I've invited three uh, real experts uh, on a practical basis to discuss the operation and effects of investor state dispute settlement, uh, each one bringing a, 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 a partially unique perspective. They are, they're all deeply uh, uh, invested in uh, investor state dispute settlement, have, have long experience, uh, but they each provide different roles. You'll see the biographical information in the materials you receive coming in. But uh, I, I, Ambassador John Verno, uh, who, who now is in private practice, but uh, is here because he was a negotiator of, uh, in, of these treaties uh, as general counsel of USTR and, uh, is, and uh, as uh, deputy United States trade representative. So he'll, he'll speak from the point of view of, of, of the negotiator of, of the government and the public interest that's considered uh, as, as in these treaties are being negotiated. Linda Dempsey is uh, Vice President of the National Association of Manufacturers, uh, heads their international division. Uh, Linda is a long time, uh, she was both in private practice and then as a, uh, as a uh, uh, staff to Senator Moynihan on the Senate Finance Committee and uh, in previous, uh, in the subsequent uh, time as a, an advocate, is a real expert in the area, but will represent the views of the investor as they, as they, uh, they, they con contemplate how to treat uh, uh, a, 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 what they believe is a treaty breach. Uh, finally, uh, Stanimer is here, who's a, who's a deeply experienced uh, attorney in international law, represents uh, uh, clients in uh, dispute settlement cases, but most importantly, is a frequent arbitrator. And Stanimer is here uh, basically to share the experience when the, invest, when the state and the investor come together, the arbitrator is, is, uh, is, is in an unusual and important situation. So Stanimer will talk about that. Uh, I'd like each panelist to offer you know, a, a few minutes of comments, and then we'll turn to each other and to the audience. So thank you. John. Thank you, Scott, and thank you to CSIS for hosting this. Um, as note, as uh, Scott, you mentioned earlier, a number of uh, organizations around town and elsewhere are hosting these events, and I think it's critically important that we raise the level of discussion and understanding of these uh, of investor state because they uh, they're, they're not well known the principles behind them, and I and I hope to speak to those right now from a government perspective. I first want to assure you that there'll be no math in my presentation, uh, <laughs> Professor Frank. Thank you for that great <laughs> presentation. Um, uh, I was an English major. I'm, I'm good for the month now. Um, uh, I'm going to regress back to my own mean, which is no math. Um, I'm going to talk about principles. And uh, whenever I can, I, uh, whenever I can start my remarks by referencing the Founding Fathers, I do because uh, they had uh, great, great wisdom. Um, in 1796, John Adams, after negotiating for the United States, the first treaty on friendship, commerce, and navigation with France said this about protecting alien property by rules of international law. There is no principle of law of nations more firmly established than that which entitles the property of strangers to protection by the host government. That is an important principle here, and that principle about not discriminating against foreign property. Um, Professor Frank, as you noted, you're, you're a, a psychology major or, or student at one point, and 
as you know better than I, there is a tendency in human nature to have this us versus them mentality that oftentimes is, uh, is unjust. And I think, we, I think uh, John Adams' remarks reflect that. And in fact, the Commerce Clause, another great and important principle of this country and our, and our former government, is about not discriminating against apples from the state next door. That principle, the Commerce Clause principle of we should treat all products, all citizens, all capital, all services based on the quality of, of those goods, services, investments per market principles, not by you know, what state uh, they, they might come from initially. That same principle is the bedrock of those of us who believe in rules for globalization. National treatment um, is a term that uh, uh, I suspect everyone in this room knows. That is the core principle embodied in our trade agreements that says we should not discriminate against foreign providers of goods or services simply by virtue of the fact that they are foreign. Investment treaties embody the same principle that you shouldn't, it is a hedge against being discriminated against based on your foreign nationality. And in that sense, investment treaties like trade treaties, they are all about eliminating, avoiding discrimination. And in that sense, they embody even a broader principle, a more important principle, which is rule of law. Um, I had a coach once who said in sports, speed isn't everything, but it's almost everything. In, in the world that we live in, whether it's commercial or, or personal justice, may, rule of law may not be everything, but it's almost everything. And when you look around the world and you see countries and societies that you frankly don't want to live in, I, I guarantee it's because you believe there is very little rule of law in that country and that you can be whisked away, imprisoned for something you said or did um, uh, capriciously, or that your property could be taken from you capriciously and without compensation. The government taking your property and not compensating you for that, that is a bedrock principle of justice and rule of law exists to assure that governments can't do that. There was an article I read, it came out almost 10 years ago, and I wish I had read it earlier in my, in my life because it would have saved me many hours of reading books and taking other courses. But the ti it came out in 2006, it was by Douglas North and others, and it, it, they, they since made a book of it, because it, I, 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 the title of it, which I couldn't resist, called A Conceptual Framework for Interpreting Recorded Human History. I thought, well, in 40 pages, I'm going to know all this. This will be <laughs> excellent, and I won't, uh, I won't need to pursue another, another, another advanced degree. This article is brilliant, and I would really commend anyone for it. Douglas North is the, is, is the author and, and others. And he basically said there are two societies in recorded human history, limited access and open access, just two. And that defines in a critical way the two societies. In limited access societies, it's basically a club. If you're in the club, it's great um, because the government, the laws, the power of the government bends to your favor. Um, it is the law of kings more broadly. In an open access society, it is rule of law. Individuals have rights. It's not just the whim of the elite. It's individuals have rights. And several years ago when the Arab Spring occurred, people forget that started with the the actions and the frustrations of a fruit vendor in Tunisia. What was he reacting against? He was reacting against lawlessness. There was no rule of law. He never knew whether he was going to have to pay a special fee or uh, uh, 
do whatever hoops he might have to jump through in order to provide for his family. That, is, that represents a lack of rule of law. So I don't shy away from advocating for investment treaties, trade treaties that help institute this rule of law. In fact, many of our trading partners, when I was at USTR, what they were seeking, frankly, was to engage in these agreements so that they, it would help them domestically deepen the roots of rule of law, mm -hmm. undertake domestic, economic, and political and legal reform. That's what these tools are for. So I know uh, Professor Frank wasn't intending this, but listening to her excellent presentation, and, and Scott's yours as well, which sort of minimizes the, well, you know, you, you know, investors don't win many of these cases, and when they do, they only get cents in the dollar. I know you didn't intend this as the takeaway, but I was sitting there listening, I was thinking, you know, the takeaway for some might be, you know what, it's kind of like a medical procedure. It's not really good, it's not nice, we don't really want to talk about it, but we don't have to do it very often, and it doesn't hurt that much. <laughs> and I take the complete opposite approach. We should be thankful that there are institutions and and rules to adjudicate disputes. That's what makes us a civilized society. That is what an open access society is all about. And that is what these agreements uh, are intended for. Now, I get that people don't wake up and you know, think, gee, how is Corporation X doing today? I hope they're okay. I mean, I get <laughs> that these are not widows and orphans <laughs> as, as, as claimants. And I, th I actually think that is in response to the question asked earlier about, you know, well, why, if all this evidence is so great, so compelling, why is there all this controversy? I actually attribute it to there's just this general anti-corporate mentality that, gee, if corporations are suing governments, that's got to be a bad thing. Uh, we, that, this cannot be good. Um, and I think we, we, we need to recognize that that's a major emotive cause of this. Um, so, as Grant said in his remarks, I too am surprised with the controversy. And um, I've, I've listed in preparation for this the five complaints that, that, I, that I see most prominently or commonly. One is it encourages uh, litigation. Well, first of all, as we saw in Professor Frank's remarks, you know, relative to global FDI, the number of disputes is to say it's a drop in a bucket would be an overstatement. It would have to be a very, very large bucket for this to be a drop in the bucket. So there's a lot of global FDI, and guess what? You have some disputes every now and again. Uh, it, the fact that you can count them is, is evidence itself that, of how few they are. Um, secondly, it's, well, it prevents governments from executing their responsibilities to you know, protect health and welfare. Come on. Really? I mean, that is not what this is about. I mean, I see these lists of all these claims that are brought. These, there are frivolous claims brought. My favorite one is this notion that Egypt is being, is being sued under investor state for raising minimum wage. That case is, has gone nowhere, will go nowhere. Governments are not being prevented from exercising legitimate authority. Look at the, the countries that are subject to most of these investor states. Does anyone think the government of Argentina, with all due respect, is just trying to do its best to protect the health and welfare of its citizens? It is not. It is not a country that has much rule of law in it. And that is, that is just the, 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 the irony of some of the, one of the groups in Washington that will go unmentioned that is most actively arguing against investor state. I looked at their website the other day, and they are also, interestingly, on record, opposing tort reform in this country. Um, if there's any list, uh, it's a much longer list of frivolous cases uh, in civil litigation in this country than there are frivolous investor state claims globally. The third argument is, well, BITS provide, investment treaties provide special rights. Well, most countries, certainly ours, has uh, an analog called, you know, the takings clause. Um, every country should have 
of that clause. I would not want to live in a country where the government could take my property and not compensate me. Um, so I don't think this is a special uh, 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 treat for people. Um, but even if, to the extent that it is, that is the nature of agreements. If I have a contract with Scott, I obviously have rights that you don't in the audience. Why? Because I'm the one with the agreement with him. Trade agreements, um, it, trade agreements unavoidably create special classes. If, if Scott in, in Scott the Kingdom agrees to give me access to my insurance companies can do business, and Scott wakes up tomorrow and says, you know what, I've decided to nationalize my insurance companies. I have a claim against him. That's the nature of trade agreements. So if you're going to be opposed to bilateral investment treaties because on principle they create special rights, then you should oppose all international agreements or all agreements of any, of any nature because they unavoidably create special rights to those stakeholders. Uh, the fourth argument that you see is this is special to the U.S.-China bit, uh, and that is, well, China can't be trusted, so we shouldn't pursue this. Um, I, I understand that argument. I just tend to take the longer view that we're, we're better off with agreements, we're better off with China in the WTO, and will there be bumps along the road? Yes, but better to have agreements with rights than have no agreements in the first place. The last argument I will say, and then I'll wrap up, I will say is at least the most, most forthright one. And, and I won't name this person, but I was in a conversation with, with someone who said, well, with the, the real objection to investor state is that they um, undermine U.S. comparative advantage. Namely, our comparative advantage is we have rule of law. They don't. So we, why should we encourage investment in countries that don't have rule of law by allowing this workaround uh, <laughs> rights provided by it? And I appreciated the candor, but uh, that I think is a very short-term view. We should be encouraging more rule of law in every country. Uh, we live in a global economy. We have a global citizenry, if you will. We should be encouraging rule of law everywhere. So um, I, I fear that this, as good as this event that Scott is putting on and CSI is putting on, I fear we will have to do this many, many more times to try to balance the, uh, the misinformation and the campaign that's out there against uh, investor state. Um, ironically, there's no one really fighting hard for this. You know, companies aren't really all that active. Linda is is, to her credit and Nan's credit, the, the most active on this. But the truth of the matter is because very few companies use investor state, have to resort to investor state, there's not many senior uh, business officials that are all that vested in it and understand the importance of it, which is why I come back to where I started. This is a rule of law tool, and we should keep it and fight for it and not be embarrassed about it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Linda. Great segue. Thank you, Scott, Greg. Thank you for having us here and, and the wonderful paper that you're working, you've done. And, and Dr. Frank's presentation was just stellar um, as usual. I'm here representing uh, over 14,000 manufacturers that are part of the National Association of Manufacturers. Our sector uh, employs 12 million uh, men and women directly. Um, and the effect of the type of discussion we're having here really does have a big effect on manufacturing in the United States. So NAM's mission is to make the United States the best place to manufacture in the world. And, you know, last year we saw the highest level ever of manufacturing output in the United States at over $2.08 trillion. And so with that mission, I think it's pretty easy to understand why I and, and the NAM advocate policies and agreements that seek to attract foreign investment into the United States. But I sometimes get asked, well, if you want to promote manufacturing in the United States, why are you supporting policies? Why are you supporting agreements with countries overseas that will facilitate and protect U.S. investment overseas? And I got to say, 
the answer to that is very easy. When you talk to manufacturers, big and small, throughout every single sector of the economy. Manufacturers, U.S. manufacturers typically make most of their investments here in the United States. Yet, as companies from Europe, Asia, Latin America, and beyond invest in the United States every day to reach our customers, to participate in our economy, so too manufacturers in the United States need to invest overseas. We need to sell more successfully to the 95% of the world's consumers that live outside our market. We need to be able to access natural resources that are outside our borders. We need to participate in infrastructure and other projects that are only happening overseas. And the benefits? The benefits come back here. They come back to manufacturers, our employees, and to the broader economy. By reaching millions of new customers overseas and participating in these types of economic activities, we are, through our foreign investments, strengthening America's manufacturing base. Our investment overseas spurs about 50% of total U.S. exports and 42% of manufactured exports out of the United States. These exports and the trillions of dollars in sales that our foreign affiliates, affiliates make overseas support higher paying American jobs and they support very high levels of research and development and capital expenditure in this country. And oh, by the way, those foreign affiliates with their billions, trillions of dollars in sales, about 90% of those sales stay overseas. They're not selling back to the United States they're trying to reach those foreign customers. So in making decisions as to invest, our companies and businesses in other sectors look at a whole number of factors. They see countries touting big consumer markets and growing populations. Indeed, that's one of the reasons that the United States has long been a draw for foreign investment. They hear about countries bragging about their geographic proximity, their um, access or their, their natural resources. And businesses will oftentimes invest in these countries where the reward could be very great, but also the risk could be large as well. But investors also look very seriously at countries that lack those attributes. And there, the issues of stability, as John mentioned, rule of law, and low risk are very important. Companies, they look at all the risk issues that are out there. And I will tell you, from talking with CEOs, the heads of international strategic development for companies big and small, the general counsels of companies, yes, they do look at whether a country has an investment a treaty, whether it has investor state, what is the risk that they are going to face. And I also think that this point about risk and the ability to attract investment is not lost on countries around the world, particularly those countries that don't have those natural attributes of a big market or resources or geographic proximity to attract investment on their own. I think it's not surprising at all that of the countries in Europe that very directly, very quickly, and very publicly told the commission that they wanted investor state dispute settlement in the TTIP are countries that actually lack those big consumer markets. They're not the big countries in Europe. They're the ones on the periphery. They lack perhaps the resources. But what they want to show is that they are willing to commit to the rule of law, to commit to lower risk in order to attract investment. So once a company has invested, they're trying to do everything they can to succeed. Uh, if they're a public company, they have stockholders. If they're not, they have employees. And I, I cannot emphasize how much we hear from our companies, how much maintaining and growing employment is actually at the top of mind. Investors, investing overseas is costly, it's complex. Investors are subjecting themselves to national laws, different governments, different cultures, and a different political system. And they try to work through a wide range of issues just in establishing an investment, let alone keeping it going and making it successful. 
and sometimes they run into problems. Sometimes they're small, but sometimes they're big. And the biggest ones are when the foreign government acts in a way that seeks to undermine, repudiate, or force out that foreign investor. And when faced with those big problems, the first thing foreign investors do, they try to work it out, right? They talk to the local government. They talk to other individuals in that country, local business groups. They talk to the US Embassy. They might talk to the US government here. They try to solve whatever the problem is. And if the issue can't be solved through that type of dialogue and administrative discussions and normal procedures within that country, then co companies consider the options, all their options, again and again. Directly suing a foreign government is an enormous step and never one that is undertaken by an investor without substantial review and consideration in my experience. I've talked to businesses about these issues and they usually try to look for any other viable path to solve their problem. But sometimes there isn't a viable path. Consider the cases we've already seen go to an investor state dispute settlement. Government seizure of property. Well, that's the easiest example. But there are many other types of government actions that negate business activity and break government promises and fundamental rights. Governments treat investors of different nationalities in a discriminatory manner, helping domestic investors, penalizing foreign investors, like has happened in the Czech Republic, Canada, Poland. Governments use their sovereign authority to destroy the credibility of an investor or an investment. They harass, they lie to investors, as has happened in Argentina, Canada, elsewhere. Governments repudiate and breach fundamental promises and contract provisions, arbitrarily renege on permits issued and guarantees made, making the investor no longer viable. As in Ecuador, Poland, Argentina, Turkey, Guatemala, we could continue. But even where an investor has faced these types of arbitrary, discriminatory, expropriatory, harassing, and other unfair actions, the choice to go to investor state is still really hard. You heard from Scott, you heard from Dr. Frank. ISDS is extraordinarily costly. It takes years to resolve. It is extremely hard for the investor to win. Even when an investor wins, the amount won is far less than sought and usually than the loss incurred. And even when the investor wins an award, they then have to go and enforce that award. And that can take years and is also very costly. And sometimes they don't succeed. This is not a strategy that any CEO, general counsel, or business, big or small, considers lightly. It is always, always a tough choice. Yet, and this goes to, as John was saying, having this option is absolutely critical for a wide range of manufacturers, service pro providers, food industry sectors that we've seen. We've seen cases in capital and transportation equipment, renewable energy, in fact, there's about 20 cases right now by renewable energy companies globally challenging uh, negative government activity, uh, traditional energy, electricity generation, consumer products, innovative medical equipment and biopharmaceuticals, water treatment, infrastructure, food products, and beyond. These issues affect a wide part of American industry and a wide sector that produces millions upon millions of jobs. So they're, you know, in a world where manufacturers are facing incredibly intense competition and an unlevel playing field in many markets overseas, to continue growing manufacturing, we need to eliminate some of those barriers and assure our manufacturers when they are globally engaged, when they invest to reach new customers and to participate in economic activities overseas, that they are guaranteed that their property and their investments will be protected and that they will have a neutral, fair method to enforce 
uh, treaties and other agreements, and frankly, the government promises that were made. So from the NIM's perspective, investment treaties and agreements, investor state dispute settlement is a critical piece of a pro-growth, pro-manufacturing trade policy. And it's not just important for the United States. It's important for any country that wants to grow its private sector through greater global engagement. Thank you, Linda. Stanimer, uh, the, the, in all the criticism of uh, investor state dispute settlement, arbitrators have not been spared. <laughs> Perhaps you can comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for having me here. It's an honor to address this audience. Um, before I answer your question, Scott, um, let me share a few thoughts about the process of investor state arbitration from, a, from the perspective of an arbitration tribunal. Um, first, the resolution of an investor state dispute is a very fact-intensive inquiry. Um, every case is different. Um, the parties provide extensive briefing on the facts. Arbitrators have to read tens of thousands of pages of material, documentation. Um, they have to read hundreds of pages of witness testimony, several hundreds of pages of expert testimony. They have to read and absorb and understand. Uh, this is not an easy task. Um, the result of that, however, is when the factual inquiry is over, there is very little disagreement among the usually three members of the tribunal about what the facts of the dispute are. Um, it was mentioned by Susan that, uh, and I think Scott started his um, introductory remarks by um, the point that the vast majority of uh, awards are um, rendered by consensus. Are rendered by consensus. Well, one very important reason for that is that having gone through this very intense factual inquiry, there is very little disagreement among reasonable persons about what the facts of the case are. And I've done an experiment. I encourage you to do that if you are interested. Um, I've done an experiment with my students. I've asked them to take an award they haven't read and read just the factual findings, and then try to guess what the final outcome was. And the rate of guessing correctly was anywhere between 95 and 99%. Um, now, the, the resolution of an investment dispute is by definition a balance of interests. Why do I say by definition? Because arbitrators operate on the basis of treaties, and treaties require a balance of interest. Treaties contain notions such as fairness, fair and equitable treatment, non-discrimination, non-arbitrariness. Um, to make a decision whether one of those provisions, one of those protections has been breached, the arbitrators by definition have to engage in a balance of interest analysis. Um, and of course, there, is, um, there has been an argument made that investor state dispute settlement per se imposes a chew on the government's ability to regulate. Um, I would say that it imposes a chill on the government's ability um, to misregulate in a manner that is arbitrarily discriminatory, unfair, and inequitable. Um, but I would also add that this balance of interests also imposes a chill on frivolous claims by investors. Um, when you see the results of Susan's research, any investor who understands what those results mean will think very hard before they initiate a claim where they don't have a serious chance of success. Um, and I can give you, uh, to illustrate the point about the balance of interest, I could give you an example, an example that in a way illustrates how difficult it is to capture statistically the win or the loss because I mean, at the end of the day, the investor wins when the investor, when the tribunal finds a breach of the treaty and awards damages, the state wins. When there is no breach of the treaty, the damages are zero. Um, and that's certainly the, the most logical metric. But there is another one, which is measure the result against the expectations of the parties. 
the parties go into a dispute with certain expectations. Um, and I'll give you an example where um, a state had revamped its energy market um, to transform it, transform it into a, an energy market based on purely free market principles. And in the process, they had to, um, well, they decided to terminate pre-existing concessions that were entered into with foreign investors on the basis of the pre-existing non-market principles. They did that with respect to public utility concessions that had not yet taken off the ground. The contracts were signed, um, but the concessions were not yet in operation. Um, and they did that understanding that there will be claims. And so the question for that government was twofold. One, how much I will pay? Will I have to pay just the investors some costs or amounts invested? Or will I be ordered to pay future lost profits through the useful life of the terminated concession? Um, I assume, or I guess, that the government was ready to pay even the future lost profits because the calculation was that the new arrangements that they had introduced were going to be more profitable even if compensation was paid. Um, but the second concern that became apparent throughout the case was that um, a case was filed by one investor and the government was very concerned that other investors are watching this very carefully and will follow suit if the case ended um, favorably. Um, at the end of the day, what was awarded was um, in the single digits of millions of dollars uh, while the claim was for hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, that was that would be captured statistically as a loss for the government. The government issued a triumphant press release um, while the investor um, issued a press release condemning the tribunal for the bad award they issued, the unfavorable award, uh, because the expectations were different. So who won, who lost is a very uh, relative question. But also the point is that there was a balance of interest in this case as well. On the one hand, the government clearly expropriated property, contractual rights, which were assets. On the other hand, what was the value of those assets? Um, and um, what was going to be the effect of the award on future government policies? Um, I do want to mention also that um, in terms of costs and damages awarded, um, this is also a very intense inquiry. Arbitrators usually have to read expert reports on damages in hundreds of pages. Um, they have to um, look at and assess different economic models. They hear and examine experts. Um, in, in the whole discussion about the outcome of investor state dispute settlement and the awards, very little attention is paid to, to the amount of damages. Um, what is, what, is, what uh, discussions focus on is um, issues relating to an interpretation of one or another provision of the treaty. Very little attention is paid to the um, damages sections of the award. This is a very difficult task for an arbitrator. This is a very difficult task for the parties as well. And sorting through the um, evidence submitted by the economic experts and deciding what the right damages are is also a very, very significant fact-intensive inquiry. Um, there is no single explanation of why um, the claims, the amount claimed is so much higher than the, the end result, the damages awarded but this is the, the outcome of a, of a very strict scrutiny of the claims and, and counterclaims or claims in the defenses submitted by both parties. Um, if you allow me also to say a, a few words about the costs and the length of the proceeding. I'm delighted that Susan, Susan mentioned that the cost of the arbitrators themselves is not outrageously high <laughs> and is, uh, <laughs> is uh, staying constant. Um, the cost of the legal representation of the parties um, goes up. Well, um, several points on that. First, this is in the hands of the parties. 
Um, and it's understandable. If there is a claim for hundreds of millions of dollars, um, parties represented by lawyers want to make sure there is no stone unturned. Um, that is what lawyers are required when they zealously represent the interest of the client. Um, so I don't think you can blame the parties or the counsel representing parties for that. Um, can the arbitration tribunal contain the costs? Um, this is not easy for several reasons. Um, first, it is difficult to form a view of what is important and what is less important uh, for the purposes of deciding a dispute early on. Arbitrators usually form that view understandably and logically later on, usually after the oral hearing. Um, before that, it is often difficult to give guidance to the parties about what they should focus on and what they shouldn't focus on because the arbitrators are yet uncertain about the critical issues in the case, not having yet absorbed all the evidence and all the materials produced by the parties. Um, a second difficulty is the difficulty of remaining impartial throughout the process. Parties are very sensitive um, to a situation where they may come to a conclusion, rightly or wrongly, that an arbitrator has made up his or her mind before all the evidence has been marshaled, before all the arguments have been advanced. And this would be indeed improper. And so arbitrators are very sensitive to a situation where they would prejudge the outcome of a dispute not having yet received from the parties all the evidence and not having um, heard all the arguments, which makes it, of course, uh, very difficult for the tribunal to give guidance to the parties and ask them to focus on certain aspects of the dispute and, and not focus on, on others, even though um, arbitrators do do that when appropriate and try to exercise judgment on when they can do that. I was, um, um, just yesterday I received an email from one of my co-arbitrators in a case saying, can you please do something about it? We received yet another unsolicited submissions. These parties are unstoppable. We need to do something to stop them. Um, yes, yes, we do, but we have to do it in a way that doesn't uh, affect the, a party's ability to fully present its case, and we have to do it in a way that allows the parties to be satisfied that they have been able to marshal all the evidence in advance, all the arguments that they considered appropriate for the purposes of the case. I think I will stop there and thank this call. For thank you, Stenemer. Uh, let me uh, now open for questions. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, Randy Cleveland from the State Department. From both this panel and the previous panel, it seems to me that one of the main problems that people have with ISDS is a lack of transparency. The proceeding is not open as in a WTO case, and the settlements in particular are not, not made public. For many people, they see the threat of this multi-million dollars uh, demand against a government as forcing it to do things the government might, might otherwise not want to do, and when it's settled, they have no clue what was actually done. It seems to me that addressing the transparency issue would be the best way to address that problem. What do you think? Well, the United States has already addressed transparency. In 2004, among the many, many changes in going from about a, a 15, 10 page uh, model bilateral investment treaty to an over 40 page uh, model bilateral investment treaty, some of the um, most important additions were to require that all the proceedings of the arbitration be public with the only exception being business confidential type of or government confidential information. So that means the notice of intent to arbitrate, the briefs filed on both sides, the hearings, all of that is public in every arbitration under a U.S. instrument negotiated after that. And then we went back and actually I think we'd done this before under NAFTA. And so you can find, if you, you know, look at the State Department's website, you can get a portal into all of those. Um, these provisions are in the CAFTA. These provisions also allow for the um, amicus and, and others to seek to provide input to the arbitration panel, which the arbitration panel gets, gets to decide. So I think those transparency provisions are, are already out there. I think uh, they make it, um, you know, probably a little bit, you know, there's a, a more uh, submissions for arbitrators to review. 
Um, but I think it, it has helped from, from the U.S. perspective, and, and we, we expect that model to continue forward. I would only add to that that one of the things we noticed is, look, this is a bottom-up system. Uh, investment treaty policy has, is bottom-up. It's, it's these 2,400 or however many individual agreements all negotiated separately. It's not like the GATT, okay? The GATT had a, a, a set of rules that everybody signed on to. Okay, and, and so the differences, there are a lot of differences between the treaties. There are also a lot of differences between the facilities in which, in which the treaty arbitration are, has heard. When Greg and I were doing the research, we noted that, for instance, the exit facility down at the World Bank provides much more public information about the cases and what's going on than does UNSTRA, okay, which is a, 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 a prominent, not as prominent, but a prominent uh, uh, facility for the arbitration. So I, I think some of this is a consequence of our, of our the, the bottom-up way we got to treaty protections for investment. So, uh, yes, sir. Um, this is Nick Perry from the State Department again. Um, one of the complaints or arguments against um, ISDS and TTIP um, has been that uh, between two developed entities, uh, where there is a strong um, court system or a public justice system. Uh, you really don't need an arbitration mechanism for investors that investors could pursue um, their uh, complaints in the local court system. Um, putting aside the argument that uh, um, TTIP might be about creating a gold standard for um, um, agreements with emerging markets and so on, what is the direct response to this, um, to this complaint or, or argument? Um, let me start it and then turn it over to John. Uh, as we looked at it, you've got to consider the existence of investor state dispute settlement in the context of what's the alternative. And the alternative for us historically, not going back to gunboat diplomacy, but the alternative has been espousal. All right? And while there is a lot of happy talk about the wonderful U.S. and European legal systems, okay, there is a very unhappy history of espousal. And you don't have to go too very far to, to find out that many companies, I would, I would uh, point you to the uh, Raytheon versus uh, Palermo dispute, a uh, dispute that went on where, where Raytheon, uh, uh, defense contractor, United States defense contractor, lost, a, had a major expropriation in Italy. This is a G7 member, okay? Uh, and uh, proceeded in local courts for 10 or 15 years. Uh, finally, there was State Department espousal. It wound up at the International Court of Justice, and, uh, and I mean, Raytheon lost. But the total time consumed was massive. And this is with a G7 party. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, Europe is, is not just Italy or not just Britain or not just Holland, uh, which Holland probably negotiates the best agreements. It is Bulgaria. It is a number of, uh, of, of other economies. Likewise, I think uh, uh, there is a Canadian company, the Lowen Group, uh, a funeral home company from family-owned funeral home company that found out about Mississippi justice in the United States. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the NAFTA case, the Lowen case. So I, I think it's very important to consider the alternative is frankly unsatisfactory. But John, do you have perspective? Um, you must have been an excellent debater because when you ask a question, then you say, but don't give the best answer in response. That's, that's clever of you. Um, but I do think since TTIP is intended to serve as best practices, I think that is a compelling reason to include it. But, but beyond that, look, if, it's, not if it, it's unlikely to be used very much, I will concede that. But that doesn't strike me as a compelling argument not to have it. Um, it is a best practice. It is a good thing to have. And the alternative is to, every time you go into a negotiation, say, basically you have to make a value judgment about the country. And I think that gets uncomfortable, as someone from the State Department would know. And so I think it's best, this is a good thing to have, and we should have it in all of our agreements. Could I just add, Scott? Um, you know, a, a few things. The United States has bilateral investment treaties with eight EU member countries already, uh, slightly different earlier. Uh, and so, you know, one could argue, certainly from the sake of consistency and having the same type of relationship at that treaty international agreement level with all members of the EU, would put all members of the EU and the United States on, on an equal footing. 
Going back to the earlier question on transparency, we don't have transparency in those earlier instruments. The many uh, EU instruments out there um, before CETA did not have transparency. And so this is really a way to update and modernize the investment relationship. But I think it's a lot more than those answers, which is the biggest part of the US-European relationship is cross-border investment. It totally dwarfs the exports and the imports. And you know, on the, the, the trade side, people say, well, you know, tariffs between the US and EU are, they're already really low. But nobody's saying, well, then let's not negotiate the elimination of tariffs between the United States and the EU, because that's gonna save a heck of a lot of money and that's going to expand our economic growth. We have a vibrant relationship on investment. We can do better, and agreeing amongst ourselves to widely respected international rules that both our countries and, and systems have already adopted in term, uh, internally is part of doing the type of agreement that's going to grow both our regions at a time we really need to. And just to add that existing treaties already encourage investors to use the domestic legal system. Um, traditional bids have the so-called fork in the road where the investor chooses international arbitration or domestic litigation. But that evolved, for example, in NAFTA, uh, I think it was at the uh, suggestion of Mexico saying, well, we want to encourage investors to use our courts and if they have to choose, they will always go for arbitration. How do we get them to go to our courts? Maybe they'll like them. And so NAFTA includes this U-turn provision where you can go to domestic courts, um, litigate, stop, waive your right to continue, and then go to arbitration if you don't like what's happening in domestic courts. Other treaties um, contain the so-called domestic litigation requirement. The investor must litigate 12 months or 18 months in domestic courts before the investor can go to international arbitration. So the option is there, but there is an encouragement to use the domestic legal system. And so if you will, the, the investor would resort to arbitration um, when the investor considers rightly or wrongly that the domestic legal system is not adequate to address the issues in dispute. I could go on all day, but uh, we have time for two more questions. I see two hands over here. We'll take them. Let's take both questions, and then uh, the panels can uh, provide responses. So go ahead, sir. Yeah. Uh, Get, wait for the microphone there. Thank you. Uh, I, Ian Ferguson with the Congressional Research Service. Um, I'm interested in note, considering there was a discussion in the last panel about an, uh, the prospect or possibility of an appellate body, uh, given that there is language in TPA uh, the current TPA and, and even in previous TPAs about that, uh, I'd be interested in knowing your panel's, uh, you all's uh, interest, uh, desirability, or practicality, a discussion of that. Thank you. And the other question? Hi, my name is Courtney Lewis and I'm from the Sierra Club. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for Mr. Alex, uh, to Mr. Alexandrov for mentioning the chilling impacts because of all the presentations here, the uh, the presenters, you're the only one who mentioned that. I did want to ask, though, you said that um, you said that ISDS can put a chill on government's ability to implement rules that are arbitrary. Um, it made me think of an example recently in which Ireland is considering plain packaging rules for cigarettes because the majority of smokers in Ireland begin when they're children. And Philip Morris, which is, of course, is already suing Australia for its plain packaging rules, have, has already given an indication that it would um, very likely consider ISDS against Ireland and other European countries if they implemented those sort of rules. So my question to you is, would you call plain packaging rules um, directed at children arbitrary? And my second question is just more broadly. Um, this could be something that Dr. Frank could answer or anybody else. but. I do think it's significant to take into account the chilling impacts of regulations when looking at the impacts of ISDS cases. And I was wondering whether there have been any um, attempts to quantify what the chilling impacts of ISDS actually is, and if not, any advice on how that kind of quanti quantification um, could happen. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's take, take those questions in order if we could. That would uh, be a good way to wrap up. On the appellate body, uh, m look, we, we have an opportunity for a test market. Uh, in the uh, U.S. Central America Dominican Republic Free Trade Agreement, DR CAPTA, uh, uh, Congress in insisted they, on an appellate mechanism. There are now, I think, five or six, correct me if I'm wrong, cases, investment cases uh, among the, tw the seven DR CAPTA parties. So, um, so that would be the first place to actually practically attempt uh, 
an appellate mechanism. Uh, it's, it's, it's not without uh, controversy, it's not without problems, but it's probably worth trying, and that's the place where there, there's currently sort of statutory uh, language to require it, uh, and we now have enough cases that the parties may want to get together and talk about it. But Linda? I'd agree with all that. I'd also point out that, um, you know, ICSID rules have a annulment procedure, which is not a, not a full appellate mechanism by any stretch of the imagination. But if there's any question about, you know, um, arbitrator bias or there's a, um, an egregious, uh, you know, action uh, contrary to basic rules, I don't remember the legal standards, I'm sure Stanimir does, there is, an, uh, there is a way to, to review those cases. Um, on the appellate mechanism, it, it is in the last grant of TPA, it's in the current bill that's up there. Um, you know, one of the things that business looks at is, you know, maybe business would want to look at it as well, but it also has the possibility of elongating it. But I think folks are willing to accept that going forward um, on that. Just a few words on the potential appellate court. It's a balance. There are pros and cons, and they have to be considered very carefully. Um, Susan was talking about the length and the cost of the proceeding, adding another layer would obviously increase the cost and lengthen the proceeding. Um, on the other side of the balance is what is it supposed to cure? Um, the inconsistencies in jurisprudence, uh, what are they, to what extent they exist, are they based on facts or law? This also needs to be carefully considered. My, my view happens to be that uh, the, um, the issue of the inconsistency of awards is overblown um, and whenever, uh, debate focuses on awards that approach a legal issue from a different perspective. That discussion neglects the main point. I can give you an example. There was a raging debate about two decisions, two awards, SGS versus Pakistan and SGS versus Philippines that treated differently uh, a provision on the treaty called, in the treaty called the Umbrella Clause. Well, in two different treaties, but presumably the similar provision. And what the, this debate missed was that at the end of the day, the the tribunals in both cases came to the same result. Um, but to the extent that there are inconsistencies in the jurisprudence, and that's a very big debate, then how an appellate court would address those inconsistencies has to be balanced against the cost and the length of the process. Thank you, and on, uh, as we, uh, we'll turn to Stanimir for his re response on, uh, on uh, regulatory chill. I would point out two things that are in our paper. First, I point to language uh, that is currently in the U.S. model bit. Which, uh, which states uh, explicitly that, except in rare circumstances, non-discriminatory regulatory actions that are designed and applied to protect legitimate public welfare objectives do not constitute an indirect expropriation. So U.S. bits are explicit about regulatory activity as long as it is, it is non-discriminatory. Uh, second, I would encourage you to examine the panel discussion in the famous Methanex case. Uh, back uh, in, at the time of the 2001-2002 of the Trade Promotion Authority debate, one of the more popular cases to discuss was a filed case by the Methanex Corporation against the United States. Methanex was a Canadian producer of a gasoline additive, MBTE. Uh, the, the language that, uh, that the appellate body used, first of all, after, after we got through the 2004 model bid, Methanex lost the case. And in the, and the, the rationale for the loss the arbitrators stated very clearly that the Methanex challenge of a regulatory initiative that was non-discriminatory and, and, and uh, legitimately applied was not an expropriation. And that seems to be the record as far as we can determine uh, for most cases. But I'll let uh, uh, Stanimer, oh, I'm sorry, uh, John, did you have a point of view or Stanimer? Um, whether or not the so-called plain packaging measures of Australia are a breach of the treaty under which the claim is filed is up to the tribunal to decide. Um, I would, in the context of a uh, regulatory chill though, um, I think we should keep in mind that those measures have been challenged also in the WTO, as far as I know, by the Dominican Republic. Um, they have also been challenged in Australia's domestic courts. Um, and so to the extent that um, we can talk about a regulatory chill of investor state dispute settlement, we should not forget that there are other means of challenging those measures. They have been challenged in those other fora. Um, and it seems to me 
that um, investor state dispute settlement does not um, provide for a more significant regulatory chill, if you will, to use that terminology, than uh, the prospect of domestic litigation or litigation in the WTO. I in some way, every time a government domestically expropriates property for in the exercise of its rights of eminent domain, there is a regulatory chew in the form of the government has to pay compensation. Um, and yet we don't consider the Fifth Amendment as imposing some regulatory chew on the ability of the sovereign to regulate or the equivalent protections of property in, in other states. Um, so to, I think the point I want to make is that investor state dispute settlement does not really provide for any bigger impact in the in terms of regulatory chill than any other dispute settlement mechanism, such as the WTO or domestic litigation. Thank you. John or Linda? Um, Stan, I uh, just made the point I was going to make. The, the only thing I would add is, you know, I sort of don't want to take the burden of proof implicit in your question that, you know, those of us who support investor state need to prove that there's no regulatory chill. I think the burden is on the people who think investor state is a bad thing and is chilling legitimate regulation. I don't think their facts are there to support that claim, but if those who want to continue to make that claim can provide some evidence, and by evidence I don't mean frivolous going nowhere claims that were filed 10 years ago. I mean claims that have been successful. That will be a very short list, and it may be a, a nil subset, uh, excuse me, a nil set. So it, 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 be no uh, I, I think <laughs> Professor Frank <laughs> said right. it was statistically <laughs> insignificant when she looked at this very issue. Um, and, you know, Stan Mayer talked about th that case in particular. There's domestic stakeholders in Ireland and in Australia beyond um, that industry that are concerned. There are other groups um, from a wide range of industries that are concerned because of the, the taking of a basic form of intellectual property, a trademark, that the government had, had issued. And so it's, um, I just go back to Professor Frank. <laughs> Look, uh, we've, we've overstayed our welcome uh, with you, but we do thank you for your uh, interest in the subject. We hope to continue on this topic with our future research. Thank you for coming, and please thank, uh, join me in thanking the panelists.